all so in the next few tutorial we will be discussing about implementation of neural networks on fpgas and specifically on the zinc platform uh, i'm not going to discuss the basics of neural network i hope many of you know about it those who do not know about it maybe you can visit uh, some tutorial especially this website is quite good one neural networks and deep learning.com this is where i learned about neural network for the first time so it gives a, a detailed tutorial and it also gives an example of neural network how we can detect uh, handwritten digits using neural network okay. uh, for that they will be using a data set called the mnist data set and they are also giving a lot of python code uh, which can do it for you okay so this gives a good background information so i guess um, you will go through it uh, those who do not have background on neural network and get a brief idea about what neural network is you don't have to understand all the lower level details but it will be good if you can understand when i say like uh, uh, training or back propagation activation function some of these terminologies you will be able to find from this one uh, again uh, i'm not assuming any particular math background that is required for neural network when we do it on fpgas because uh, we'll be reusing a lot of concepts from this uh, software implementation so even if you don't understand all the math behind it especially the training part the back propagation algorithm it is still fine okay so in this first tutorial i'm again just going to give you background uh, what are the important concepts when we are targeting a hardware implementation of neural network how it is different from this software implementation that is the main focus in this first tutorial and in the subsequent one we will be looking at the actual coding and verification so we are uh, beginning with a fully connected neural network again what is a fully connected neural network uh, we can read in that website or here i have the picture so in a fully connected neural network you will see like every neuron in a particular layer is connected with every other neuron in the previous layer okay so this is like a four layer neural network we have input layer output layer and two hidden layer and every neuron in this hidden layers as well as the output layer is connected with every neuron in the previous layer that is what we call as a fully connected neural network this is also a feed forward neural network that means the information it always goes only in one direction from input layer towards the output layer there is no feedback uh, from one layer to the previous layer so we have other kind of neural network like a recurring neural network where we have feedback mechanism that we may discuss in later one so this is the simplest uh, neural network but for many applications uh, these neural networks are quite useful now as i uh, mentioned before when we usually design a neural network there is a part called the training of the neural network where you have to decide what are the different weights as well as the biases for the neurons involved in the neural network now when we go for hardware implementation especially fpg implementation in most cases we will be using pre-trained network that means we are not going to do this training part in hardware instead of that we'll be doing the training in software uh, we get these biases and weight values then we use those values to design the hardware now there are many reasons why we are not doing training in hardware you know, one of the most important one is uh, for building a circuit which actually does training we need a lot of resources and the algorithms like uh, back propagation algorithm which has uh, differential terms and all that is not very hardware friendly okay? it's quite difficult to implement and even if you implement it uh, as i mentioned we need a lot of hardware to do it and in most cases we have to do training only once for a particular neural network so if you do it in hardware again that is a resource wastage after training we don't need that part of the circuit so it remains there which is a lot of resources finally which will be consuming no more power and in many applications this training is not a time critical thing because uh, one motivation for using hardware for neural network is for acceleration to do things faster now uh, training is not a part of it right you do training once 
it doesn't matter how much time it takes maybe one day or two day to do the training and you are doing it only for one time, one time. Now, once you translate it to an actual neural network implementation, what we are looking at is a real-time performance in, in detection or classification kind of problems. That is what is time critical. So it's okay to do training in software, then uh, do the real-time operation in hardware. Okay? These are uh, general cases. There may be uh, exceptional cases where you have to do training on the fly also. In that case, we will have to do training in hardware but for the particular implementation that i am going to do the training is done in software and we'll be using pre-trained network for hardware implementation now another important thing or issue when you go for hardware implementation is how you are going to represent numbers uh, in hardware for neural network now the input to the neural network they are usually positive numbers so these inputs can be uh, pixel values or sound sample depending upon what kind of neural network you are building. In most cases, these inputs are positive number. Now, the weights and biases, they can be positive or negative number. Okay? Uh, and these numbers, input as well as weights and biases, they all will have a fractional part. They are not usually integers in most cases. Okay, now when you have this fractional part, we have two choices to represent it. We can either go with the IEEE floating point representation, and uh, there itself we can again two choices for 32 bit representation, we call it as a single precision implementation or 64 bit implementation called the double precision implementation. So, based on whether 32 or 64, you will have uh, more precision, you can represent larger number. That is one uh, choice. The other choice is called a fixed point representation of the numbers. So these are the two choices. Now floating point representation, uh, you can look at it, uh, those who haven't seen it before, um, how numbers are represented in floating point using IEEE uh, standard. Now the advantage here is using IEEE format, you can represent very large numbers uh, using floating point, okay, 32 bit or 64 bit. And uh, the challenge here is the implementation and manipulation of floating point numbers are very difficult. Okay, In this representation, you cannot just go ahead and just add two numbers if you want to add them. We have to do some operations uh, uh, before you can add numbers together. Addition is especially challenging. Maybe multiplication is easier in IEEE representation. And for doing all these manipulation, again, we need a lot of hardware. That is the main challenge. So if you go for IEEE representation, the number of neurons that you may be able to implement in a low-end chip like the Zinc 20 chip in our Z board, it may be a few tens of neurons. That's all you can implement. Uh, but for a, a practical neural network implementation, you may need a, maybe a hundreds of neurons. Okay, So that's why we don't prefer floating point representation because of the resource consumption. So we'll be going with so-called the fixed point representation for representing all the numbers. And in neural network, again, mostly the input to the neural network will be always normalized, either between 0 to 1, uh, if they are always positive. If they are negative, we will normalize them always between minus 1 to 1 plus one. So it's okay to go with fixed point representation because the range of numbers uh, are not that huge. Uh, that is one advantage of uh, IEEE representation. You can represent very large number, but here we usually don't need very large numbers. Small numbers are good enough. So fixed point representation also works. But uh, the small drawback of fixed point representation is uh, the loss of accuracy. I will show you with an example. Yeah, because of the fixed point representation. That may uh, bring a slight error in the calculation, uh, maybe one or two percentage error compared to the floating point representation. And again, for most applications, that is acceptable, these kind of small errors. But we'll be able to minimize that small error also by choosing uh, appropriate fixed point representation. Now, look at the example here how we represent things using fixed point representation. So when you go for fixed point representation, you need to define few things. You need to define like 
what is the total number of bits that you are going to represent the number and out of these how many bits will represent the integer part of the number and how many bits will represent the fractional part of the number and you are free to choose any number you are not restricted by 32 or 64 you can choose any number for example here i am taking an example of 15 bit representation and i am saying like out of these 15 bits 5 bits will represent the integer part of a number and 10 bits will represent the fractional part now by by making such de definition uh, you are restricting what is the maximum range of the number that you can define especially using that integer part and you are also defining what is the precision of your representation mainly using the fractional part so 15.84 i'll be representing something like this so this is 15 using 5 bits so once you define like you will use 5 bits for integer you should always use 5 bits to represent that integer even if it requires less number of bits and these many bits represent the fractional part 0.84 yeah. so this is what we call as a fixed point so the position of this point the decimal point is always fixed here it is always after five bits that's why we call it as a fixed point representation now in floating point representation the position of this uh, decimal point is not fixed for any number it moves around depending upon the number you want to represent that's why we call it floating point the point is floating now, um, in this representation, okay, so this number is supposed to represent 0.84, but if I really look what it represents, it doesn't represent 0.84, it is actually representing 0.83984375 in decimal. So there is a error induced, which is like 0 0.00015625. That much error is in induced, which is quite small if you see. It is less than... 2 to r of 10 to r of minus 4 percentage uh, so if you look at a standalone number that is fine but especially in neural network kind of scenarios where you keep on multiplying and adding numbers this error will accumulate and uh, it may affect our performance so we need to choose our representation uh, especially total number of bits and how many bits for integer and fractional part very carefully for that we should be aware of what is the range of the input that we are expecting? What is the range of weights? What is the range of biases? Based on that, we'll have to choose the appropriate representation. Now, same example as uh, before. Uh, if I choose like 10 bits for representing my number, out of that, 5 bits for integer and 5 bits for fractional, same 15.84 will look something like this. And uh, this again represents 15. And this fractional part, is only representing 0.8125 instead of 0.84 so now you'll see like the error is increasing okay so basically the more number you have to represent the fractional part the more accuracy you will have and of course you should have enough bits to represent the largest integer part that you are expecting so by fixing the number of bits what you are basically doing is a trade-off between the accuracy and resource utilization okay so the larger the uh, total number of bits that you are going to use the more will be the actual resource utilization uh, but better will be the accuracy the smaller vice versa now as i mentioned before uh, inputs are generally positive but your weights and biases may be positive or negative so there should be some way to represent negative numbers also so a uh, traditional digital circuit like you can either go for sign magnitude representation or two's complement representation okay I, I guess most of you are aware of these two representations so in sign magnitude representation the most significant bit uh, the leftmost bit it will represent the sign if it is zero that represents it's a positive number if it is one it's a negative number and uh, remaining n bits will represent integer part and some m bits will represent the fractional part same as before same example as before now i have five bits for integer part but uh, out of that five one bit is actually used for sign so one bit for sign four bits for integer remaining for fractional so if i compare these two numbers just by looking at this bit i will say like this is a positive number then this four that is 15 and this remaining that is 0.8398 Okay, so that represents plus 15.83. Same way, I just change this bit 
from 0 to 1, I have minus 15. So the bit pattern remains exactly the same except for this MS bit. That is what is uh, sign magnitude representation. Now, uh, it's very easy for us to decode from sign magnitude to decimal number for humans but it has many drawbacks okay one one of them is it has two representation for zero we can have plus zero and minus zero right and that is one issue but the major issue is when you do arithmetic operation with sign magnitude number so if you add two sign magnitude represented numbers it doesn't guarantee the result will be in sign magnitude okay so that's a headache uh, that's why we have introduced this two's complement representation. I guess you know about it. So two's complement is nothing but uh, you take one's complement of a number and add one to it. So again, in, in two's complement number also, if you look at the MS bit, you will be able to tell whether it is a positive number or a negative number. If the MS bit is one, it's a negative number. If MS bit is zero, that is a positive number. And other advantage, uh, of course, you can go ahead and read about it. Two's complement because obviously it's not a course on digital circuit design. I'm not going into that depth. So look here. So again, in two's complement representation, plus 15 will 15.839, it will look exactly the same as before, but minus 15 point, it will look something like this. But by looking at this bit, I can say this is a negative number. So I'll write negative. Now to really find the number, I will have to take two's complement of this number. So you flip all the bits and add one to that and you will be getting this number. So this is the one which is representing minus 15 point. Okay. So for addition uh, as well as subtraction, which is basically addition only, two's complement representation is very efficient. Uh, but for multiplication, uh, two's complement may not be very efficient because again, if you multiply two two's complement numbers it doesn't guarantee the result will be also in two's complement format okay so we'll have to do some manipulation there so that the result also follows two's complement we'll see it when we do the coding so that's about number representation uh, final thing is on so-called the activation functions uh, which we'll be using inside our neurons okay and uh, many neural networks the neurons are using uh, non-linear activation functions. The recent one like uh, ReLU and all, they are re linear one, but many neural networks, again, our example will be using the non-linear one. In that website also you will see they are using non-linear one, which is a sigmoid function with uh, this representation, one by one plus e to r of minus x, or sometimes we use hyperbolic uh, tangent function also with this representation. Okay, So these are non-linear one, and if you try to really implement them in in digital uh, that's very challenging you may see research papers which are proposed to do this in uh, digital domain using Taylor series expansion and all but when we look at a practical point of view uh, this is not very practical again main challenge is resource utilization you may be able to implement it but uh, just one neuron is not enough for you you may need hundreds of neurons and you won't be able to share this uh, implementation among multiple neurons. Okay, so that will take a lot of resources. Again, you won't be able to implement many neurons inside our zinc chip. So that's why we go with the so-called the lookup table implementation. Again, this lookup table, don't confuse with our FPGA lookup table, which is a basic building block of FPGAs. This lookup table or LUTs, this is a very popular technique in digital design as well as in software design also. So what you do is you pre-calculate these values, one by one to one plus e to r of minus x uh, for different values of x, okay? So for doing it, you should again have some idea about the range of x, okay? So the input. So you should have some idea what is the range of x based on that you pre-calculate all the values of it and uh, you represent it using um, our two's complement format or sign magnitude format, whatever we choose in binary, and we store it in some ROM. Okay, and uh, the address bus to this ROM will be this X. So when we give X to that ROM, he will give me the pre calculated value, whether it is sigmoid or hyperbolic tangent, whatever it is. So these ROMs are what are called as lookup tables here.
LUTs. Again, we will see in coding how it is done. Uh, another last topic is about using IP cores when we are going to design our neural network. So we generally won't instantiate, especially in my sample case, we are not going to use any Silings IP core directly. Uh, that is mainly to make our design more flexible. Because if you use Silings IP core, and if you want to change some parameter, for example, I used a lookup table for implementing the activation function. Later, I decided like, okay, the size of the lookup table is not enough. I need to increase the size. You cannot just change it by changing a parameter in Verilog. Instead of that, you will have to go to this uh, Silings core generator and you will have to change it in the .xci file. Okay. So that makes our code not very flexible. That also makes our code not very portable. For example, if it is in pure Verilog, you can implement the same neural networks in Intel FPGA or Lattice FPGA also. You don't have to uh, go through the core instantiation or something like that. It becomes very portable across any FPGA or even for ASIC implementation. Okay. So that's why we are not going to use any signing IP core. But these Silings IP cores are very efficient in implementing hardware. For example, uh, again, if I take the example of lookup table, we have two choices. We can build them either using block RAM, which are the built-in primitives inside Silings FPGAs, or you can build it using so-called the distributed RAM, which is basically uh, built by combining lookup tables and uh, flip-flops. Now, block RAMs, their clock performance is much, much higher than distributed RAM, and we usually prefer block RAMs for implementing these kind of ROM. So what you need to do is we need to follow certain coding style so that Vivado, he automatically understands that I am trying to infer this particular primitive. Okay, so if you follow that uh, coding style, he will automatically instantiate block RAM, he will automatically instantiate uh, DSP slices, etc. So again, that style also we will see when we uh, do the coding. Okay, so that's all in this introduction. So in the next tutorial, we'll start our coding. Thank you.